You know, over the years, we've had a lot of people ask us a bunch of questions about bullets, shells, and everything in between. Now, there's a lot to talk about, and we've got a table full of stuff, but let's start with shotgun shells and gauges, because that confuses a lot of people. If you're an expert in this area, um, you'll love the information. If you're a newcomer, you're going to find this fascinating. Mark Marasini, who's with us today, just happens to know a little bit about this. And who have you taught these things to over the years? A lot of Boy Scouts, um, friends, relatives, people who are getting into it early, people who've been into it for a long time. And it's kind of interesting the way you started the show because in the last five, six, eight years, we're seeing a lot of young adults coming back into hunting, getting into the hunting, didn't grow up hunting. Mm -hmm. And this can be confusing. Now, for those of us who have been in the field a lot and we've used um, shotguns, probably one of the most common is, is a 20 gauge you start out with. Some kids start out with 410. Tell us what that means. What does 20 gauge as opposed to 410, 12 gauge, 10 gauge, et cetera, 16 gauge? What does that mean? Technically, uh, if you had 20 balls made out of lead that, that equaled one pound, the diameter of that ball is the diameter of a 20 gauge barrel. And that's why a 12 gauge shotgun is actually a bigger gauge than a 20 gauge. And that's the first thing some people who are new to shotgunning need to, need to recognize is that a 10 gauge is bigger than a 12, a 12 bigger than a 20, and a, a 28 gauge is much smaller than any of them. And a 410, not even a gauge at all, it's a caliber. As we look at this, and we look at this, Explain the primer, the powder, the, the load, so on and so forth. They're both cartridges. This is a rifle cartridge. It has a single projectile. Mm -hmm. This is a, a shot shell. It goes in a shotgun. It has a lot of little projectiles, small, tiny, round balls of lead. But a shotgun is probably the most versatile shotgun that we have. Uh, you, can, you can change it just by changing the cartridge. Obviously, that's a 20 gauge shell right there. It, it's yellow. But it's, not, it's got a single projectile in it. It's a, it's a slug. We would use that for deer or some other kind of game. That would pack it, a pretty good punch. It's it, a would bigger... pack a, it would pack a real wallop, and it's, 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 a, it's a good deer hunting cartridge. Now, speaking of the slug as opposed to this, do you, should you have a change of barrel maybe if you're going to go from a uh, shot to a slug? Not necessarily. I mean, you probably wouldn't want to shoot this out of a full choked barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be done. It, if you do it the right way, I suppose. But you can change that shotgun from a deer gun, mm -hmm. a very good deer gun, to a rabbit gun. You wouldn't want to shoot a rabbit with this one. Wouldn't be really anything left. But that's a number six, which means it has a lot of small pellets in it. And then you could, you could go to something like this, and now you're ready for shooting doves. Now, explain the pattern. Explain what happens when you shoot a, a shotgun shell at a moving target, which makes shotgun wonderful for moving targets, quail, rabbit, squirrel. Shot uh, is controlled by the choke of the barrel or even a choke tube. Now in, more, in newer guns, you can change the chokes. The shot expands when it leaves the barrel and it expands at different rates depending on the choke of the barrel or the choke of the tube, which means a tighter choke would give you a tighter pattern at a longer distance. If you were going to shoot targets close, if your score you were set up 15 yards from the tree and it wasn't a real tall tree, you might want to use a more open choke than you would if it were if you, if you were shooting one a lot farther away. Let's talk about the difference between a say a number eight load, which would be nice for dove, mm -hmm. or a turkey load. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the difference. Um, in, in both of them. Uh, you have multiple pellets that are, that are in the shell. Number eight is a lot smaller shot, which, which means you can get more pellets into a shell. A turkey load, people generally use uh, numbers fours, fives, or sixes. And this, some of them are a combination of them. But you're looking at putting a lot of pellets in a small area. Uh, shooting at a turkey, the, the vulnerable parts of a turkey are generally just the head, brain, and maybe the, the, the spine in, in, in the neck. So it's really a small target, even though it's a very big bird. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to put a lot of pellets in a very small area, which means you would use a very tight choke 
and you would use a shell that had a lot of shot in it. Now, there are also some situations where there are different types of uh, shot. You have lead, then there are certain areas where you can't use that. Let's talk about steel shot and some of the other types of shot. Uh, waterfowl or, or hunting in, in areas that have been declared non-toxic shot only, such as some of our wildlife management areas that are near waterfowl nesting areas. You know, uh, waterfowl are susceptible to shot year round. Uh, shot that doesn't hit your target, that, that falls into the surrounding marsh, uh, settles to the bottom, which is where waterfowl pick a lot of their food, which means they would ingest some of those lead pellets, and it leads to mortality in birds that are outside the hunting season. So, so uh, you'd want to use a shell that is steel shot, or maybe another kind of non-toxic shot, uh, some of the heavy shot shells out here. You wouldn't want to use any lead shot, and it's not even legal anymore. It hasn't been legal for at least 25 years or more uh, to hunt waterfowl with lead shot. Let's break down the shell itself. Let's talk about the different parts of a shotgun shell. Five major components of, of, of a shot shell. You have the case. The case is what holds all the components together. The head of the shell right here, this is the brass part. It's you, on, on, the, on the head, it will tell you what gauge that shell is. The, the head of the shell also houses the primer, which is in the center of, of that. And the primer is, is what the firing pin on the shotgun strikes. It causes a spark which ignites the powder charge, which is another component. The powder charge is usually in the snug down right here under the brass part. Between the powder, well, above the powder would be, would be the wad. And, and it's a cushioned wad now. And, and a wad and a shot cup are usually one piece, sometimes two pieces. And the shot cup is the shot charge itself. So, and then, and then, uh, then the, the crimp. So there's five basic components of, of a shot shell that go in to make it a cartridge. Now, as I look out here in front of us, I see anything from this tiny little guy to this guy right here. Let's talk about the most popular gauges of shotguns. Um, probably the most popular gauge would be the 12 gauge, but, but they do. They go from this side, which is a two and a half inch 410 caliber shell. It's not actually a gauge. This has a half ounce of shot in it. Let's talk about the beginnings. Um, I see some old boxes here. I collect some old boxes. How did things start out? I know there were paper shells. And it looks like you've got some brass there. There's paper shells here. There's, I don't. Know. There's there's paper shells around here somewhere too. But, but yeah, this is a, this is a solid brass shell. It goes all the way from the from the head of the shell to the crimp, and it's it's solid brass all the way down. This one also is a is is a metal case all the way out to the to the crimp, and it's not really a crimp in these. It mm -hmm. looks like it's got a paper wad that's holding all the components in there and keeping them from falling out. What's the, the lifespan of, of, your, of your shell if it's kept in a dry, stable environment? Oh, I've, I've got shells that are 50 years old that I've fired, and they fire just like they did when they were new. Uh, of course, you might have some that go bad, too, but <laughs> <laughs> that brings up a different scenario to talk about. You've got you a brand new shotgun. You're going to the store. You go and look, and there's all these numbers on top. It might be confusing to the first time shotgun shell buyer. What's all this mean? For example, this is steel shot. Steel shot and waterfowl loads. Uh, 12 gauge, this is, it goes into a 12 gauge gun. It's a three and a half inch shell, which means not, it, it goes into a shotgun uh, that accepts three and a half inch shells. Make sure you chamber. have a gun that takes it, a three it, and a half inch shell. This is limited. This, this one won't even fit into uh, this shell. It's a magnum load, magnum dram equivalent, which means that th this one is, is is as heavy a load as you can get. Uh, the next one is one and nine sixteenths ounce of shot. And steel's lighter than lead, so that's a lot of shot in that shell. And this size BB is probably good for geese. Uh, you know, so that's it's a big old honking shell. That's right what there. that means. But, but we did bring up something that we probably should touch on. And, and that goes back to, to probably these two shells right here. This one is a two and three quarter inch shell. Most of your older shotguns will handle a two and three quarter inch shell. This is a three inch. A lot of shotguns are chambered for both of these, but some are not. The interesting thing is that when you try to put this three inch shell into a, into a shotgun with a two inch, two and three quarter inch chamber, it'll fit in a lot of them. The problem is uh, there's no room for the crimp to open when the shell is fired, which means you have a very narrow opening right there. You could be holding a pipe bomb. You could be holding something 
that's going to go off in a way you don't want it to go off. And you might well understand that there's a lot, there's, a, there's an explosion happening right there, just a few inches in front of your face. So, so on the gun, it will tell you two and three quarter inch. If it doesn't have three inch on it, that's right. Don't do it. If, if it's a really old gun, newer guns will, will be marked two and three quarter inch, three inch, mm -hmm. three and a half inch. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of your really older guns, two and three quarter inch shells. There were no three inch shells at that time. There was no reason for them to mark them and they did not. But uh, understand before you use a three inch shell or a bigger shell, three and a half inch, make sure the gun that you put it in is chambered for that, for that round. Now let's move into the wonderful world of the cartridge, the bullet, as people <laughs> call it. Now let's, let's start from the bottom and work our way up. First of all, again, what does that mean when it says .22 or 25.06? What does all that mean? It's, it speaks to the caliber. The, the .22 is the caliber of the barrel, which is the diameter of the barrel. .22 is almost a quarter of an inch. So to, to, to break it down into, into other terms that we use every day, uh, .25-06 is a, is a .25 caliber rifle. And the alt six goes back to the 30 alt six shell. A 25 alt six is a neck down 30 alt six. A 30 Let's alt explain six. what neck down is. 30 alt six cartridge was was developed for the military back probably 100 years ago, and uh, it shot a 30 caliber bullet. Uh, a 270 is also a neck down 30 alt six, which means. 30 out 6 would have a 30 caliber bullet in it. This has a 27 caliber bullet in it. A 25 out 6 would have a 25 caliber bullet in it, which means it's, it's got a lot of power a, behind it. Uh, a 30 out 6 is not as quite as flat shooting. Uh, the 27 caliber bullet is a lighter bullet. The 25 caliber bullet is a lighter bullet. They're flatter shooting. Both of them are outstanding deer calibers. A lot of knockdown power behind it. A lot of a lot of powder behind that. A lot of a lot of the same amount of powder behind those those bullets. The bullet being the projectile that that leaves the cartridge, and uh, they would they would just be a lot flatter shooting. Uh, 25 out six outstanding varmint rifle for. Let's talk about each part of that bullet that you're holding? The entire unit is a cartridge. It's a rifle cartridge. Uh, the, the, the components of it are similar to a shotgun shell in that we have a case. The case on this one is solid brass. It's necked down right here. Uh, and that, it's necked all the way down to the caliber of the bullet because it holds the bullet. It's crimped around the bullet. The bullet being this part right here that leaves the shell, the projectile. The brass uh, at the bottom of it uh, that's the head of the shell. It's stamped on the head of the shell. The caliber of the bullet, the caliber of the cartridge is stamped right there. The, in the center is a primer. The primer is struck by the firing pin. It emits a spark, lights the powder. The powder burns very quickly, does not explode. It burns very quickly and creates gases, rapidly expanding gases that push the bullet from the cartridge down the barrel. And as it moves down the barrel, those expanding gases accelerates it till it reaches full velocity when it exits the barrel. Through a rifled barrel, which means? Which, which means as it's, as it's traveling down the barrel, it starts spinning. Why is that advantageous? It's advantageous because it increases the accuracy. A bullet that does not spin is not really accurate. This is something that, that distinguished the early rifles in America from the British muskets, we'll say. The, they, were, they were just straight barrels. They were not accurate past 30, 35, 40 yards at best. Couldn't hit, couldn't hit anything. And then, uh, but we learned how to rifle the barrels. And that made those early rifles, those flintlock rifles, accurate out to about 300 yards, which was a considerable advantage in those days. There are charts and apps that you can actually put on your phone now that it, when you are sighting a rifle in, let's talk about trajectory of a bullet. What happens when you fire that gun? Bullets leave the rifle not necessarily in a straight line, uh, more so in a parabolic arc. Uh, when you have a, well, a scope or even open sights, now they're line of sight. When they're a straight line just like a laser. Well, the bullet, when it leaves the rifle barrel, actually crosses that line twice as it, as it comes up and then as it's going back down. And so 
the, the bullet will, will rise when it comes out of, out, of the, out of the muzzle of the barrel and it'll cross the plane, the sight plane of that scope and it'll rise above it. And then when it starts to lose a little steam, it's, it, it, it crosses it again as it's fallen to the ground. Uh, so when you're sighting in a rifle, you're actually sighting in, you're trying to match up the, the, the scope where the crosshairs are with where the bullet, bullet will fall. It's, it's, it's like the, the rifle lobs the bullet out there. And, and when you're shooting long distances, uh, the, the, the bullet is actually falling faster uh, the further away it gets. Once it, once it reaches the top of that, par that arc, it starts to fall rather quickly. Let's talk about what is a foot pound. It's the measurement of weight <laughs> that the bullet impacts with. And that, and that, that it's a combination of bullet weight and bullet velocity. And that changes at different distances. And there are charts and, and the apps that you're talking about, the charts that you're talking about, uh, will lay those out for you to give you some idea of, of how much energy that bullet is going to be carrying when it strikes the target. Um, anything else that you want to interject in any of this? Or shooter to, to, know, uh, to know their skill level. Just because the rifle will do it doesn't mean the shooter can do it. And the way you do that is to train, practice, learn the fundamentals of shooting a rifle. They're, those fundamentals are as important as the fundamentals in shooting a basketball or, or throwing a pitch or swinging a ball bat. There are shells that are meant for hunting and there's shells that are not. And uh, some are illegally used. Let's talk about the difference. Kind of hard to tell the difference, um, but it's marked on the box. One will say full metal jacket. Uh, the other, or it might say military ball ammo, or you might have gotten a hold of some military ammo. If you want to go out and target shoot, uh, outstanding. Uh, it, it, it's a good use for that. It's usually pretty inexpensive. But if you're going to be hunting, they're not legal. They're not legal to hunt with because it's military ammo. It's designed to penetrate uh, armor. It's, it's designed to disable to, to, to stop threats. Uh, this is designed for hunting. It's a pointed soft point. Uh, there, there are hollow points. There's other Let's ammo. talk about the physics of what that softer bullet does as opposed to this one. The softer bullet will, will hit and expand upon, upon impact or as it, as it creates a wound channel. There's different kinds of bullets and, and, and this is important also to turn, depending on what game you're going to hunt. Deer hunting in Kentucky, it's a small, it's a small animal. Most, most uh, hunting ammo is fine for deer. Not necessarily for elk, not necessarily for bigger game if you go out, out west. You want something that's going to give you a lot of penetration and expansion, which gets you into some of the partition bullets or, or some of the bullets that are designed for bigger game. They're designed to give you more penetration and expansion. When a bullet expands, on, on impact, now you're delivering more of that energy that we talked about earlier and instead of, instead of just getting a straight pass through. This is designed to penetrate, it'll, it'll travel through, it'll keep on going out the other side and you must think about it that really any, any energy that's, that, that's used outside as it, as it, on a complete pass through is wasted energy. If this looks interesting to you and if you want to try this but you don't have the resources or availability, there are sportsmen's clubs all over Kentucky, and we have hunter ed courses that you can take and learn all this information as well. And most of the people at those sportsmen's clubs are really passionate about this. They want folks they, to know. They, they, they welcome the opportunity to, to show you this stuff. Most of those sportsmen's clubs have instructors who are members who would gladly sit out there and spend 10 minutes with you. And listen, 10 minutes actually on the range with somebody who knows what they're doing it's really, really valuable. It, it's, it, you, you can't learn that one in a book or on YouTube. If you'd like more information on how to get involved in the shooting sports, well, I guess you'd call 1-800-858-1549 or fw.ky.gov. Check out where some sportsman clubs are. Find out when hunter ed courses are, and you can do all this sort of stuff yourself.